Hey, you all, Farmer Jesse here. Welcome to the No-Till Market Garden Podcast, episode 35, season two. Only three episodes left in the season, and they're going to be awesome, starting with this amazing conversation I had with Daniel and Taylor Stein of Bryceland Forest Farm in Humboldt County, California. We get into quite a few things, uh, but two things in particular that we have not dug into so much on this podcast, and that's cannabis in the market garden and production scale hugel culture. We did talk hugel culture a little bit with Susanna Lane, which was an awesome conversation. Um, cannabis, not so much. I don't think I've talked about it at all on this podcast. Uh, so we're going to dive into both of those things, which were super fascinating to me. And of course, there's a whole bunch of other good no-till tidbits. But first, I could not bring it to you without the help of our show sponsors like BCS America. You already know about the legendary versatility of BCS two-wheel tractors on the small farm. You know it's the most economical and time-saving choice for market farmers. Building beds with the rotary plow, mixing amendments with the power harrow, and mowing cover crops with the flail mower. But a BCS two-wheel tractor can do much more beyond the small farm. BCS powers more than 40 high-quality PTO-driven attachments, each with the power and performance of an all-gear drive transmission. Blow snow with BCS's snow thrower, also known as the snow cannon. Chip and shred debris with the chipper shredder. Clean your property with a pressure washer. Irrigate your lawn or garden with the high-pressure irrigation pump. Haul over 800 pounds, including yourself, with a rideable utility trailer. And now, spread compost evenly over 30-inch beds with the all-new spreader attachment. Yep, BCS is pretty much the Swiss Army knife of power equipment. Check out bcsamerica.com for the latest attachments, videos, promotions, and more. That's bcsamerica.com. Also supporting the show today, Farmer's Web. Farmer's Web software makes it easier for your farm to manage working with your buyers. By lessening the administrative load and increasing efficiency, Farmer's Web helps you save time, reduce errors, and work with more buyers overall. Our free account includes features to manage your real-time and coming soon product availability and tools to create your own availability calendar to inform buyers on the seasonality of your products. The free account also includes access to the Farmer's Web Guide to Working with Wholesale Buyers, which offers pro tips and best practices on how to work with restaurants, schools, and other similar buyers. A one-month free trial is available of the paid account, which includes features to manage your customers and orders, give select buyers special pricing and payment terms, track your buyer's payments, send invoices, keep detailed sales records, and much more. You can even manage orders for buyers who don't place them online. Access a demo video and learn more at FarmersWeb.com. Big shout-outs to all of our show supporters and enough from me. Let's get into this amazing interview with Daniel and Taylor Stein of Bryceland Forest Farm. Daniel and Taylor Stein, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks, Jesse. Absolutely. Super excited to have you all. Um, First, maybe you could just give us a sort of rundown. Tell us a little bit about the farm, where you're located, how much land you're working on there, and those sorts of things. We are a very small farm. We are in southern Humboldt County uh, in northern California, about four hours north of the San Francisco Bay Area in a, in a very rural community, about a half an hour drive from, from the Pacific Ocean and the coast here. Um, we're on 160 acres of forest land, but our, our veggie and, and our cannabis operation combined are slightly less than an acre of land, and our homestead sprawls across possibly five to six acres uh, of the land. The rest is uh, forest and, and creeks and, and much of it inaccessible and steep. Okay, and then where are you selling your both cannabis and produce? Well, with the produce, um, which comprises about three quarters of an acre uh, of our cultivated area, we we sell it to two farmers markets. There's a, a farmers market in Garberville, which is our closest uh, small town, and then we started a small farmers market with friends here in Bryceland, which is 
kind of more just an area where houses are closer together more than it ever is a town. Um, and then we, we have a CSA and um, up until recently restaurant sales. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And the, the market is still, the market that you just said is still going. Um, so they're both seasonal markets that start in the beginning of May. Um, okay. We're planning to have both of them going this year. The The Garberville market will be uh, uh, limited to uh, essential vendors and, and uh, kind of restructured. And we're not sure about the little Bryceland market um, right now because it was very much a, a market based around gathering families and children and um, mm-hmm. we're, we're hoping to have it open. Right. You know, we've loved our farmer's market. So much of what uh, drew me to wanting to grow food is that interfacing with customers and an interfacing with the community around food um, and our small little market in our kind of hamlet of Bryceland. Uh, we cherished it. We cherished that, you know, it became like an impromptu play date for all the moms with young babies and things like that. So this year, with concerns over um, the COVID virus and just, you know, the uncertainty that we all share and looking forward. um, I've been really thankful that we uh, expanded our CSA program this year before any of this was on our radar. Uh, We just knew that we really liked where that was going and it was a new model for us, even though it's certainly not new to agriculture, but it was very exciting for us and we happened to it this year. So it feels like it was, of course, a good timing to do so because I think it's going to be a way that people get food um, and feel really secure at the same time. Um, they, they're limiting their exposure. Yeah, I agree. It's funny because we did the opposite. We actually got rid of our CSA over the winter and then oh, had, wow. to kind of, had to kind of jump start it, um, which worked really well because we had the infrastructure sort of in place. But um, can you talk a little bit about some of the details of how that CSA works? Is it delivery? Is it? We're working it out um, as we go. Um, We had a small CSA last year, and actually a a good portion of that small CSA last year was through a distributor that we've worked with for our cannabis that um, bought the CSA for all of their employees locally. and we would deliver it to them at their at their warehouse and and they've shut that program down so we expanded out into more of the market and as we were setting it up um there's a community here that's on the coast called shelter cove that's um relatively isolated and and pretty far out there and one of the restaurants we work with is a small brewery out there and we were working with them to to have a csa drop-off location there where people could come and and you know, we can hang out and they can have beer and pick up their CSA boxes. Um, and now um, we're still going to continue with that. And, and a lot of our CSA shares are in that community. But um, it, it doesn't seem as much fun now that we can't hang out at the brewery and uh, distribute the shares. <laughs> right. Yeah, that it's, it's wild. So you're thinking more just central drop off location or... We're going to do a drop off at each of our farmers markets. So we have a Garberville farmers market, a Bryceland one. Even if the markets don't happen, we will uh, be there at the timing they would to do a drop off. And then I'm um, going to continue with the third drop off out um, out at the coast. Yeah, and we're going to turn that into a forced family break at the beach <laughs> because I'm, we're really learning as we go on, especially with having two young kids, how tricky it can be to make sure you're getting those moments of rest and reset. So we thought, it, you know, in addition to this wonderful restaurant and pub that was, a, a you know, a really a community spot, the, the ocean and the beach there is fantastic. So I'm kind of viewing that as a, a bonus that we get, <laughs> like, you know, we're flipping it that it's, we'll travel out there and then we'll be in a place that's off farm and we'll get a moment to, to be as a family out there. So finding those hidden benefits everywhere. Yeah, that's great. Stacking functions. <laughs> right. Perfect. Um, okay. So tell us a little bit about how the farm came to be. So um, the land that we're on um, came from my parents. And, and my parents were, were both um, New Yorkers um, of the baby boom generation and, and left and became part of the, the hippie back to the land movement and ended up here in Northern California. Um, 
and and found this piece of property with their friends and community in the area. And they spent a short time homesteading here before they uh, moved on to to pursue other careers. My mom on to Hawaii and my my dad elsewhere. Um, so I, um, after going to college, I spent some time back in Hawaii where I got deeply into uh, permaculture and into farming, working on a on a couple intensive lettuce farms and then um, doing some landscape permaculture development around the island. Um, when I got the opportunity to move back to this land that stayed in the family to start um, recuperating it from from uh, disarray over the few decades that no one was here, um, I, I jumped on the opportunity. And uh, that was about 20 years ago, I came back and started rebuilding this homestead. Uh, and um, not farming, but continuing to study farming in, in university here in California. And then Taylor has her own story of how she got here. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I had been living in Hawaii at the time that I met Daniel, and I was on a similar arc. I was working on a few different, um, primarily lettuce farms and mixed veggie farms, and also uh, mentoring under a couple of different food forest designers and permaculture. Um, farmers and just, you know, very inspired and was, you know, at the point of looking around, trying to find a, a piece of land to to work in in these ways I was getting so excited about. Um, and also finding how difficult that is to do um, and unless you are independently wealthy. So I, of course, was finding uh, sources of income. And for me, I was uh, working, I, I kind of trained myself up to do web development and um, computer database engineering so that I could work remotely um, as I, you know, with with a partner at the time, um, looking for a way to make money while farming until the farm could make its own income. Um, and around that time, uh, my partner and I decided that that wasn't our shared path anymore. And uh, so I found myself in a position where I could work remotely from my computer. I was extremely inspired and just so passionate and ready to start farming. Um, and then happened to meet Daniel on his yearly, you know, trip back to visit his family in Hawaii and spend some time there. And it was, you know, just like meeting someone who's on your exact trajectory and path and so ready to, to work hard on a shared vision. And then, of course, he had this amazing property in Northern California that was already, you know, a, a decade of work had gone into it with all of the kind of invisible infrastructure of an off the grid. Uh, homestead, all of the solar and hydro and all of the irrigation lines or many of the irrigation lines, it was just an incredibly exciting time to step into a farm together and a, a, a farm project. And at, at that point, I'd, I'd really rebuilt a homestead and I'd been um, growing a small amount of cannabis to to fund the, the rebuilding of this homestead, uh, of the basic infrastructure, you know, even paying uh, paying tow trucks to take the dozen old cars that had somehow accumulated here over the years, and uh, and hadn't really stepped into uh, food farming beyond a, a kitchen garden. And um, you know, when Taylor and I met, we both shared this vision together so much that that after we. Um, fell in love and decided to to move in together here we um that first year um got goats and decided to start going to farmer's market and at that point we were still working on a uh, of an acre and opened up the the brushy areas that are now the majority of our farm and we immediately started doing um doing micro greens and value added things like making sauerkraut from the cabbage we were growing and things like that and having having a tiny little little booth at the local market in wh what year are we talking about when this when you kind of started to get into more market farming 2010 is that right yeah. I, we kind of started sounds, sounds good <laughs> is that a decade ago <laughs> <laughs> Every year with a kid is worth three, so it feels a lot longer in some ways. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, 10 years ago. And the initial, you know, 
the the way that we incrementally scaled up our garden and our you know initially it was just a large garden and um the cannabis in a similar way uh you know when i first came to this community i was i grew up in utah and then had of course been living in hawaii but had never you know we all had images of what cannabis was but i don't think many people were thinking about how cannabis was grown and uh certainly even fewer were thinking about what a community of cannabis growers would be like. So it was so fascinating to come here at that time and see uh, an agricultural community um, sharing this kind of crop under that kind of, uh, under the context, the political and the social context of that time. It was, it was really eye opening. You know, I, I, it's, I have fond memories of coming here and just having this whole private world on, open up. And uh, so Daniel at that time, compared to most folks, was growing a very, very tiny amount of this incredible plant (laughs) and uh, was, like he was saying, using it to fund some of the initial infrastructure pushes. And then when we came together and kind of had a shared um, vision around what an expanded farm would like look like for us early on, we, we knew we wanted to grow more cannabis, but we wanted to scale it up gradually and in balance with the rest of our um, drive to grow food. Um, and so it a little bit, you know, I would say the farm really kicked into a, a, a different level of operation about seven years ago. There was an initial three years of just kind of th- opening up new spaces that had been under um, white thorn, which is a, a nitrogen fixing, um, fast growing kind of tree shrubby brush that was on this beautiful vein of old um, alluvial like uh, creek bed soil that you could you know when Daniel and I first came to the farm and and had these visions of expanding we crawled through this thicket into the middle of it and he we dug into the soil like we were opening a present or something and it was just gold it was so beautiful under there and so it was about seven years ago we decided let's let's move into this area let's scale up our water storage and let's do this right that's cool can you talk a little bit okay so was was cannabis growing legal in 2010 so cannabis growing was in a gray area starting um as far back, I, I don't remember exactly what year it was. Maybe it was 1999 where Proposition 215 passed in California. And what Proposition 215 did is it, it legalized medical cannabis without very many details on what that meant. So there were a lot of, of legal loopholes where, um, depending on what a doctor recommended for someone, you could have quite a lot of cannabis or 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 very little depending on what your doctor prescribed if they prescribed for you to juice green leaves of it then you could have hundreds of plants that you used for that purpose and there was also not details in that law of um of how medical dispensaries were provided for with cannabis so so um you could form a, a collective where you had a number of patients who who had a prescription for cannabis and you as a farmer could grow that for them. And for each patient there was, you could have a certain number of plants. But what effectively it came down to is it made um, enforcement of, of grows and farmers who weren't offensively large basically uh null uh, the the police um and in general the the state police and and mostly the the federal police just stayed away from from smaller grows because it was such a gray area in the law right and then humboldt county kind of became famous for marijuana didn't it well humboldt county became famous for marijuana um e- even significantly earlier than 215 uh, 215 in, in many ways wasn't a great thing culturally for Humboldt. What Humboldt County became famous because you had all these back to the land hippies that came up here and all of a sudden with cannabis there was something that they could do to be able to support, you know, mom 
paw style um, homesteads in the hills. It was remote. It was a plant that, uh, you know, hippies already had a big affinity for. And, um, you know, it made enough money that, that, you know, a, a 70 or 80 year old person could grow a, a couple plants and in, in their yard and, and be able to support themselves on it. And what really happened with 215 is, is the, the risk of growing a large amount went away enough that you had people starting to move here to, to take advantage of making money off of it rather than to use it as a way to support a lifestyle of being able to be here and, and live on the land. And, um, that, that set off, a a, a series of, of both positive and negative effects in the community. Yeah. Um, and as it, you can imagine. What, when I arrived here, 2000, around 2009, I think that was right around 215 had been in effect for a while, but we were starting to see the, the takeoff of just this completely different model of being here instead of these tiny little carved out homesteads that were really in balance with the forests and the creeks and the rivers, there was just this extractive, you know, similar to logging and similar to some of the other rushes that have happened through resource rich areas. But this was just kind of yoked to like a a younger risk taking extractive group of folks that came and were, you know, with no exaggeration, just clearing mountainsides and cutting down trees and plowing right down to the rivers and the creeks and, um, you know, doing things really out of balance. So it, you know, Humboldt's name had been on the map and I think will remain on the map because in addition to that, the cultural context and the history that allowed cannabis to be such a a big crop in this area, the, the terroir, the climate, the this area, it's really, really hot. You know, it's a Mediterranean climate, so extremely hot, dry summers. You won't see rain from May until, you know, September, October. Um, and those really hot days and then really cold nights. You know, there can be a 50 to 60 degree swing in the temperatures from day to night. Um, just lends itself so well to the growing of like premium cannabis. So, the the name got on the map and I think will remain on the map, but uh, the the cultural changes that each of these um, kind of legislative moves or or, or legal compliant uh, regulatory moves has just changed the fabric of the community multiple times over the last couple decades. And really, the the hope for the ecology of the place um, here and and what cannabis afforded. As a, as a community is, is most people here live on 40, 80, 100 acre parcels and we're growing a quarter of an acre around their homestead. So um, land management of private land here previous to that back to the land movement was, was mostly industrial timber, which would be clear cut harvested every 40 to 50 years or, or quicker. And, and it was a an extremely environmentally degrading um, land management strategy. So, so folks who who were able to support themselves off a very small portion of the land they were living on, and and, and preserve and, and do restoration on the rest, was um, really beneficial. And we're all really hoping that um, that because it started in that direction with the change. In, into to legalization and uh, and compliance with with uh, the the newer cannabis laws that some of that good land management will really carry across. Interesting. Okay, so let's talk about cannabis for a second in terms of how do you sell it now? Because the laws have relaxed a little bit even since two fifteen, and are you just generally speaking like in a normal year? Are you just setting up? at the farmer's market and selling the cannabis in bud form? Is that, how does that work? We wish so much. <laughs> yeah, okay, <laughs> that, that, that would be exceptional. That was actually, the dream. It, it, the laws have actually not loosened. They've gotten significantly more strict. When, when California passed Proposition 64, which, um, which somewhat legalized recreational 
cannabis. The, the main thing that it really did is set up the structure for the industry of cannabis. And that structure, though we had hopes early on that it would um, be um, lean towards smaller farms and, and helping um, some of the, the best actors and the, the legacy small farms that were happening here, it, it kind of did the opposite. And, and it set up a system similar to, to alcohol um, where there is the necessity for a, a central distributor that everything. So what we create there, there, there's layers and layers of regulation and layers and layers of, of bureaucracy and different agencies involved to the point that, um, basically between the taxes and fees, they, they take about 50% uh, of the profits of it. Um, we have to, we, we can't process it on farm. We have to send it away to a distributor who processes it, holds it for testing, and then um, distributes it to to disp legal dispensaries in the state. So there, there's multiple hands that, that touch it along the way. And every time it moves hands, there is um, taxes levied on it. Wow. Okay, so with 50% coming off, is it still profitable? We don't know. <laughs> Each year is is a new, you know, for the small small farmers, it, that is very unclear. Um, and I guess our our plan so far has been to keep going until it doesn't make sense. And we've loved growing this crop. We know we're growing a type of medicine or a type of you know recreational medicine, whatever, however you want to view cannabis and, and its end use, we're growing a quality of that, that in many ways is just unparalleled unless, you know, another farm is doing similar practices and which thankfully there are, there are amazing small farms growing this, this crop. Um, so, you know, the challenge of course is a lot of the, the slow food movement and the, the refocusing on how we're growing our food and the relationships with the farmers and what a boon that has been to small farms. We definitely had these visions of cannabis legalization opening a, a path like that, where we could take it to market and really con uh, connect with customers about the quality of this, you know, this, uh, you know, basically mind altering substance um, and how it was stewarded, how the land was cared for in its process and how beautiful this plant was grown. And so we've just been so much cut off from that potential to, to add value to a crop that we're growing in such a valuable way. Um, and then we, to some extent, so no direct sales was a big hit to its profitability. And then of course the, um, regulatory burden, all of these fees and taxes, and to some extent, they're just so unsustainable for a farm of any size. Uh, I think we are holding on to see how that changes as time goes on. And um, we've seen efforts and we've participated in efforts to try and speak to legislatures about how, how much this is not, you know, that this is, this is an agricultural crop and we're farmers growing it. And, you know, the burdens that these, these rules and fees are placing on us are so unprecedented for, for any agriculture. You know, so often it's the opposite. Um, so there's a hope that that will change. And um, also we've we've been so passionate the whole time about learning how to do, you know, every farmer I think is ultimately doing, if they're, if they're, if they have this goal in mind, they're ultimately doing the same thing. They're learning how to grow whatever they're growing in the absolute best way for the land where they are. And, you know, cannabis so much is of this place we feel really passionate about continuing to learn every year. We learn so much about how to do it better and then become a way to, to teach that or share that information. And in order to do that, we would of course have to be a legal cannabis farm. So it's almost viewing like we may have a role in the legal cannabis market that somehow is not as dependent on the actual crop we're growing, which is an, an interesting position to be in as a farmer. But um, it's very uncertain times, which is not new to farmers, but it's unusual. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's interesting to hear it from that perspective because it does present like, I think there's only a hand 13, 17 states or something where it's legal even 
some places only medically legal, um, you know, altogether. So there's still quite a few states that may be able to use that as a cautionary tale um, mm -hmm. before it gets passed to go to their legislature. And and we had hoped that that California would be amongst those because California wasn't the first state to to pass a recreational cannabis. And there there was um, lessons to be learned from Colorado and from Oregon. And um, and it, it really felt like it was going that way with California. Um, at first, there was a one acre cap on farms so that you wouldn't um, immediately open up this industry to large vertically integrated uh, farm dispensary industry businesses. But that um, got taken out of out of the wording of the legislation kind of at the 11th hour um, in a in a backroom deal. And, and um, when it when it got rolled out, there wasn't that limit to um, keep the competition low for small farmers to be able to get a foothold in the in the legal market. Wow. OK. And there's. Yeah, go ahead. We could go way too far down that rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no. I think it's I think it's super fascinating, but I want to make sure that we get in a lot of mm -hmm. stuff about your your farming practices. So um, maybe let's pivot to that for a moment, at least the I want to talk just um, you have these really interesting Hugel bed sort of system. Can you describe um, let's d dig into that a little bit. Can you talk about how those were set up? and kind of how you use them? Yeah, so th it's a relatively new thing. Um, uh, I think our oldest Hugels are four years old now, and it's something that we, we discovered um, through, the, through the regenerative cannabis community. We had um, won the Regenerative Cannabis Farm Award at uh, the Emerald Cup, which is a large cannabis event here in California. And... Um, Previously, I'd, I'd kind of balked at the idea of burying wood in my good soil um, and, and limiting uh, what I could do with it in that way. But the, the more we, we dug into learning about cannabis and, and, um, and through that learning about um, aspects of soil in general, um, cannabis is a plant that is somewhere, it, it's an annual, but it's such a long-lived woody annual. It seems to build relationships in with the soil and with other plants in a similar way to how perennials would and, and prefers a, a heavily fungal dominant soil. Um, and so looking at ways to do that, um, obviously that's uh, a lot of the inspiration for us with no till is, is to, to find those um, more fungal balanced uh, ecosystems compared to, to um, a rototilling garden. But, um, with the Hugels, you know, we looked around here and, and trying to, um, from a permaculture perspective, close our loops, you use what we had here on farm to create the, the best possible environment for, for what we we're growing. What, what we have here is a tremendous amount of, of heavy, heavy woody material. Um, and, and so we, we got, got into the Hugel technique, which is really, um, Burying wood, uh, uh, both large and small and, and high carbon material under layers of soil and, uh, and other compost and then managing it very much like a, like a Ruth Stout kind of lasagna gardening sort of a way. Um, and, you know, uh, it, it's a high input building, building this. We, we built most of the Hugel beds we have with, with a mini excavator where we could dig out a trench, um, pile up wood uh, and recover it. But we've just been amazed with the, the amount of life and the diversity. Sorry, I'm, I'm getting distracted. I, I can hear a uh, uh, bay in the background there. Um, <laughs> it get, get. Oh yeah, it's all good. But, um, we've, we've just been amazed with the success of them. Um, we, we like how the management of them goes. We like the diversity of life. We're seeing the amount of, of fungal activity. And, um, we, um, part of the decision-making to go that way with most of our, most of our cannabis areas that are, are full-term areas actually came from, from having to comply with legislation to grow cannabis. One of the things we had to do 
was to provide a very detailed map of exactly like draw a red line around each bed of cannabis and it has to be in that area and they'll come to inspect it and they'll they'll pull out tape measures so it it didn't allow us to and, to rotate. and i want to just throw in there daniel that like that the the idea of you could provide a map that shows where you will grow a crop for the rest of your farm life was just so you know deplorable to us we'd been very much into like rotating crops and thinking about crops over time let alone in place and um it just shows how rare the the idea that you would grow cannabis intercropped with vegetables was you know it still is there are there are definitely farms out there doing it but at the time if you were a cannabis farm you were exclusively a cannabis farm and there was no flexibility in the rules to allow for a cropping system or irrigation needs for your other you know it was it was just a foreign language to in that process and we could rotate um technically if we hired an engineer to draw up new lines submitted it with fees each season as to where the rotation was happening um and it just didn't seem feasible so looking at having cannabis growing in the same beds year after year after year made um, me really look at is potentially is this something cannabis would like this is a plant that um when you see hemp growing wild in the the ditches um in the midwest it it makes a stand where it comes back year after year after year and it it made me think perhaps it it's a plant that likes to to grow in its own decomposing uh, matter from the previous year. Um, and I feel like that is anecdotally what I'm seeing that, um, as long as the pest pressure is taken care of and, and ultimate vigor and health is focused on that cannabis does really well growing in the same spot year after year. And, um, that, that led us towards Hugel beds, which, um, if you're not trying to do um like direct seeded annuals or efficiency uh, of planting and harvest um it, it's a really great system for for creating a lot of fertility without a lot of work and the other benefit we're seeing already especially in a system like ours like i mentioned the mediterranean climate where we don't see rainfall all summer it's a great way to it that all of that decaying carbon the, all the lignans that the wood in the soil is a sponge and it just holds water so much longer um and all of these plants are tapping into that and when you extend the fungal networks how far they can reach the water down there it, it we're seeing really amazing water retention and availability in the hugels yeah that's interesting so what's the dates to maturity on cannabis it really um depends so cannabis is a a crop that that matures that starts flowering based on on a photo period on light um so usually they transition from here at, at this uh latitude they transition from from a vegetative growth to a flowering growth around the end of july beginning of august and then can flower for anywhere from a month and a half to, to three months plus, depending on the variety. And um, there are ways, and, and we, we take advantage of some of these, to, to use uh, occlusion tarps and hoops to, to force a flower mid-season while the plant is smaller and replant and get another complete harvest um, as the light gets uh, lower in the fall. And most, you know, full season cannabis plant goes in the ground around early May, right? Early mm -hmm. May. And we start the seeds beginning of March. So from March until October, you have that, that plant. Right. Can you, those, you, you have, or you've had in the past, those tunnels, like the farmer's friend tunnels with mm -hmm. exclusion tarps, right? Or well, mm -hmm. how do they, what are they called? They're. Oh, deprivation, light uh, deprivation tarps? They, they call it, yeah, light, light deprivation. You'll or often silage just hear tarps light depth. if you're... <laughs> yeah. Right, right, yeah. Light that's, depth. Okay, right, light. Okay, so how do those... Can can you describe what those are, how they work, and and, and, 
and because they're really interesting. I feel like they have potential for somebody who's maybe a vegetable grower that wants to put, um, I don't know, shade cloth or something up, but maybe doesn't want it there all the time. Like, can you kind of run it, take us? Yeah. Through that? So we, we, um, we run a couple different systems to, to, to do light deprivation for cannabis. Um, and the main thing is that you have to shorten the daylight period, extend the dark period so that it gets um, tricked into flowering during mid-season. Uh, one of the systems we've set up to do that is um, with the farmer's friend, uh, the, just the simple hoop tunnels, not the uh, gothic ones. And um, we don't put any plastic over it. We just have the hoops. Um, and then we put... Um, the silage tarp over it, uh, panda plastic, uh, light occlusion tarp. There's all sorts of names for them. Um, so that we can attach it with a wiggle wire at the, uh, at the pearl and along the top ridge, and then, um, use like greenhouse side cranks to be able to crank that occlusion tarp up to the center so we can open it and close it easily. And, um, we, we close that here uh, at about 5.30 in the evening, leave it closed until it's fully dark, and then open it back up again so that we add about three hours of dark to, to, um, to the night uh, during the June-July period in, in midsummer um, and force uh, a flower crop that's harvested at the end of July and then and then replanted with uh, another round that will naturally flower at, with the the shortening days in the in the autumn. One kind of sweet, you know, happy coincidence in that was as we were moving our vegetable uh, acreage or whatnot, our vegetable production into no-till methods. Um, we had not only from us, but the whole community, kind of like an endless surplus source of the, these occlusion tarps, which we ended up, um, in, you know, methods that we learned initially from Fortier, the market gardener, of using these tarps to kind of, you know, passively incorporate cover crops and sprout those first weeds. It was just a very on-farm need met instantly <laughs> it was like an end of life for these tarps that have become an important part in the cannabis production yeah that's cool so you're not managing all of the farm on those hugel beds right like that's just for your cannabis operation yeah. cannabis and we also view it as a place for seed collect you know uh, vegetable seed production so we always plug in um in addition to the the many beneficial flowers that we plant for the the protection of the cannabis crops uh, we also um, try to do like isolated breeding projects of different plants that we intend to save seed for. And maybe just like a couple of, you know, some of these hugels are closer to the house. So I view them as my kitchen garden, like run out and grab. But we're not doing the market production on the hugels. Are you tarping those hugels? Like how are you, what are you doing for weed control on them? So it, it's 50 50 we're actually managing some beds that are in our our farm in a, a lasagna style similar to how we're managing the hugels but without any buried wood the hugels themselves um, we're not tarping they just um, they're they're not perfectly straight and they're they're heaped pretty high so it becomes awkward to tarp them what we've done with them is um, we've we've crimped and then covered heavily with with compost and manure and wood chips and leaves and rotten straw and kind of a variety of whatever we have on hand and then and um covered thickly with a straw mulch to smother the cover crop okay so you, so when you said crimped you have like a cover crop already existing and then you're crimping that down and then you're pouring you know then you're heavily mulching over top of that Oh, I have that right. Yeah, that you know, this is a relatively new thing for us, a new discovery. One of the challenges that that I was running into with the Hugel beds is um, one of the the ways you want to man manage Hugels is by continually putting material on the top and not really pulling the material back to to expose the soils at all, and that made it really hard for us to to get an adequate cover crop planted and 
And here where we have relatively mild winters, it's like half of the year um, should be photosynthesizing biomass to add to these uh, beds and to add to the soil. So I, I was having a lot of trouble um, getting cover crop to sprout effectively in the mulches and the covers that were on top of the hugels. Um, and then in the last couple of years, we got access to um, some dairy manure solids from a local organic dairy. So what I started doing is, is taking composted dairy manure solids and laying them just right on top uh, of the straw and grass um, and hay mulch from the growing season and planting a cover crop directly into the, into the manure and, and growing that as the cover crop and then trying to integrate that back in again without any turning or without any um, disruption uh, of that soil surface so that we're only um, continually building up and not, not pulling back any of the layers. Right. Neat. And then the, in terms of like the, you said there was a lot of, you know, they're coming out there and they're measuring that you're planting your cannabis where you said you were going to, they don't care. Like you said that they weren't necessarily encouraging sort of inner planting and those sorts of things, but they don't necessarily care if you do that stuff. No, no, they don't. I mean, in, in some ways we, we pay per square foot for, for our cannabis. So we do lose out a little bit by, by inner cropping because you know, we're, we're paying between two and $3 per square foot to, to grow cannabis on our land. And so if we have a, a couple square feet worth of artichokes, uh, it, it's not great, but it adds to the, the health and vigor of the, the whole farm so much that, that it's worth it to us. Hey, you all quick interruption from me to get a word from a couple more show sponsors like tilt soil, tilt soil makes living potting soil approved for use in organic systems from food scrap compost in Cleveland, Ohio. Tilt Soil is committed to making outstanding growing media to help regenerative and organic farmers be as successful as possible. Their blends are suitable for seed starting and germination, transplant production, and indoor specialty crops. Learn more about their products at tiltsoil.com. Our show is also brought to you by you. You can support our work through patreon.com slash farmer Jesse or through Venmo at no till growers. Just kicking us a couple bucks and saying thank you is huge for us. Um, it is what keeps the show going and at a certain level on the Patreon page, or if you just bump up from one level on the Patreon page to another, you get a shout out on the show. So big shout outs this week to JM Fortier, Kevin Keen, Ryan Goser, William Henpen, and Yannick LaPlante. Huge thank you to all of our show supporters, and really amazing to see it continuing to grow. If you can't afford to contribute, that's all. it's all good. Don't worry about it for now. But if you can and you appreciate the work we do, that's awesome too. Everybody's awesome. Back to Bryceland. Neat. Okay, so talk a little bit more about the vegetable operation. You talked about making sort of lasagna style beds. How does that work? So the lasagna style beds are, um, are still for the cannabis production with the vegetable production. We've primarily been, um, operating under the inspiration of, of like Elliot Coleman, JM Fortier of the, uh, BCS, uh, power Harrow broad fork methodology. And, um, and moving more and more when when it's appropriate towards uh, not broad forking some areas, not not using the the power harrow unless it's necessary. Um, and I, I keep going back and forth a bit on it because um, it takes us, I would guess, um, two to three weeks longer um, with the silage tarps down if I don't use the power harrow, then it would with it. So I'm always weighing for a specific crop, whether I want two to three weeks more of, um, of cover crop growth in the spring when it's really booming, or whether I'd rather have a completely undisturbed soil surface going into that, that crop rotation. But we've, we've broken up our farm into, into a regular areas. We, we have zones of eight sixty foot long beds a piece um, that we manage as, um, as 30 inch wide, 60 foot long raised beds, um, and, and are just 
playing around and experimenting with with what works best with that to do do the least amount of uh, disturbance possible and and still have a good effect. One of the yeah, and, the and thing, one thing. Oh, go ahead, Dan. Uh, I was just going to say one of one of the things we've run into is uh, because of the cannabis industry, we don't really have access to inexpensive compost here. We'd really like to do more of like a, a deep mulch composting. Um, but compost here, the quality tends to be pretty poor and the expense pretty high. So we, we make a good bit of our own compost on farm, but, but not enough of it to, to, um, to be able to do deep composting for more than uh, a zone or two every year. And, uh, one thing I was going to mention is from the beginning, it, it's been neat to observe how the cannabis would inform how we grew our vegetables. And then we try it and find the the places where it didn't quite work for vegetable production and then we'd switch it and then that would inform how we grew our cannabis so we'd go back and switch how we grew that and what i'm realizing that means is we're we keep drifting more towards kind of the fungal dominated undisturbed soil profile and just like how do we get there and it's just gone back and forth always pulling back to the least amount of disturbance and so it's been this incredible guiding crop in that way um but yeah, in addition to the to the use of the tarps to to you know expedite the breakdown and the incorporation of the the um, cover crop, we've also been working with just crimping and leaving that as a, a mulch on the surface and figuring out ways that we can you know do even less. And <laughs> something that I, I think a lot of farmers that start moving in the direction of no till, I, I certainly had felt this because having not been raised anywhere near a farm, had no no idea how food was grown. And learning about it was on it was on an organic farm, but very much uh, very conventional practices. It was just such an an unlearning to get back. It's it's amazing to me how much you have to unlearn these processes that are just the dominant methodology. And then it's so exciting with podcasts like yours and then just, you know, the regenerative farming movement in the cannabis world and outside of it, just how incredible we can find this path with through all these different, you know, there's so many paths to the same goal. Um, and it has made farming so exciting in this way that will, I think, carry forever. It just is this forever dance with the place and the the soil profile and the crop. And um, I know for both of us, we've been really thankful for how cannabis has allowed us to view production in these different time frames and different techniques. Right. That's, I, I mean, it's really cool. Like, um, I, one, I agree with you on podcasts and all the information that's out there, not just mine, everybody's. Like, it's great to have these, this sort of aggregation of, of all these diff, all this different information. Um, and I, I think that the, the cannabis thing is really interesting. Uh, here, I guess the closest thing we have to it is hemp, but it's, and it's not dissimilar in terms of farmers having to sell it to a middleman often, and then that middleman then sells it to you know a distributor or maybe gives them back a bunch of CBD oil or something. Um, but it's also, yeah, there's a big chunk taken out of it, so it's not as profitable but it is cool to think that there's these crops that we can finally grow um that you know maybe teach us a little bit more about vegetable growing or a little bit more about soil in a way that we has legally been out of access mm -hmm. for us cannabis and, and hemp uh marijuana and hemp are, are the exact same plant with with different profiles of uh thc versus cbd and it it's it's neat to Think about how many farmers are discovering ways to grow it and, and experimenting with how it fits into their vegetable production now, because that's been a big part of, of our focus here is, is how does cannabis integrate with our vegetable production in the areas that we're growing cannabis? Um, the, the full season and cannabis that we're growing starts out, you know, as a seed, obviously, and by September, it's a, a 12 foot tall, 10 foot diameter bush. So there's all this potential for intercropping and all this space in the bed that's available 
through part of the season and and not as much in in the remainder of the season. So, like what we've done with that is, is we've uh, in our main cannabis production beds that that aren't Hugel beds but are being managed like Hugel beds. There's a bed in between each of those that um, the cannabis will eventually shade out and cover. But we managed to get two to three rotations of um, spring crops, radishes, arugula, cilantro, lettuce, um, crops like that in it. And still, after those crops are done, have enough time to um, have a, a rotation of buckwheat that can then be cut down, seeded in the fall cover crop, and then not watered so that they will sprout with the first rains with the fall cover crop and be ready for that production again the following year and and we get some income from those areas prior to the the cannabis coming coming in it's funny you mentioned the seed is that are you producing your own seed is that something that you have to buy in are you able to grow your own plants what does the plant propagation look like in terms of cannabis yeah we we do produce our own seeds um and then we also, with the light deprivation, it, it's often done with clones so that they, they have a, the same flower period. Um, and so we produce our own seeds. We, we grow some seeds that, that other um, breeders have worked on. And then we've also done collaborative efforts with, with breeders and seed companies to, um, like, we, we grew a, a light deprivation crop with a with Humboldt Seed Company, who's who's a local seed company here, that um, we did a seed start crop, and then then cannabis has has male and female plants, so you have to to separate them out, wait for them to show, um, and then and then separate them out. And we grew um, two hundred and fifty or so female plants in a light deprivation um, zone, and we cloned all of them and and saved those clones with with uh humboldt seed company and then at the end of the harvest we cataloged and judged and and selected the one of those plants that were there uh, as the the phenotype that we wanted and and uh told humboldt seed company the number and had cataloged all of the clones so that they now have the clone of our favorite of those 250 plants, and we can get that back um, as clones to plant out our, our light deprivation the following year. How does the cloning work? Like, I, I guess maybe I don't understand how that specific thing... So the cloning, um, usually a seed company or a nursery will... will um, take a cutting off of a, a particular plant that has an exceptional smell or cannabinoid ratio or terpene profile um, growth pattern and um, grow that up as a, a mother plant. And that has to be kept with supplemental lighting so that it doesn't go into flower and it stays in its vegetative state. And in the vegetative state, as it grows, you can, similar to... to cloning a, a tomato or a, a, a fruit tree or anything it can be cut and rooted and and propagated that way so um, we can plant out an area of um, exact genetic copies of the nicest smell or the best uh, cannabinoid profile from a crop we've had in the past and you know for us it it, it is very good for cannabis to market people like um consistency and and predictability in, in the product but then we we feel it's extremely important for us to balance it with preserving seeds and continuing to develop seed plants and um and then also for for the full season plants we're really not um that excited about growing clones because they of course uh lack the vigor and and uh robustness that that a seed started plant would have when you produce a you know cannabis plant you have like you said it's 12 feet tall 10 foot in diameter 
what are the products that you're getting off of that? Is it just the buds or are you getting leaves as well? And then like, is there a bunch of biomass left over that you can use? Like what are the byproducts? Yeah. So, um, yeah, we're getting a, a bunch of byproducts. You, you, you have the, the best flowers, the buds that will be, um, sold as buds in, in little jars for people. Um, you have the the small flowers and B grade flowers, which get um, put into pre rolls or edibles or extracts, um, and then you have a tremendous amount of biomass. <laughs> so uh, we we chip up the woody biomass. We we leave the roots in the ground to break down over the winter, and. Um, and chip the stalks and stems and often feed a lot of the leaves back back to our to our goats and the the leaves have have uh no thc or or cannabinoids in them or or, uh very little so we don't have stoned goats (laughs) right um are the is that a generally speaking is that like a byproduct that your area has a lot of access of like are people selling mulched cannabis plants hmm. i have not well, seen that now but that, that would be an interesting thing and with the the regulation around it daniel correct me if i'm wrong but you have to account for every gram of plant mass to yeah. prove that you either chipped it or burned it we actually had to argue for the right to keep our chips right like we had to mm-hmm. <laughs> we had to, in our plot plant Farming practices because <laughs> they wanted to see it destroyed under this new paradigm. Well, what they would most like is for you to hire a company who will come safely dispose of your um, your uh, biohazard waste or whatever they, they view it yeah. as. Uh, so we had in our plot plan, we have to have a compost area. We have to have it clearly delineated. And if they find... Um, cannabis composting outside of the exact compost area that you showed it on your maps they'll get upset but we've seen in these yeah it's it's the the layer of that that kind of thought process on top of agriculture is just so bizarre and i'm certain this has happened to other farmers and other crops but it is they just it's such a different language the language of growing a plant and the language of regulating laws but uh we you know speaking to that mulch the the cannabis mulch we find the most beautiful fungal clusters and networks and you know it it is such a fungal rich mulch it's amazing yeah that it's funny it's this is the kind of conversation that i hope our kids get to listen to and laugh about because of how ridiculous these regulations are (laughs) yes i think in those terms all the time (laughs) (laughs) so every one of our plants jesse has a plastic tag with an rfid chip in it every one of our hundreds of plants big or small and we are supposed to be every time we pull a leaf off of it uh, or do any pruning we're supposed to weigh that and record that into uh, a very clunky computer online uh interface like every leaf that comes off of them during the season it's um it's enough to make you crazy. I, I do a lot more interface with um, really clunky computer programs than I ever, ever wanted to. Yeah, you moved pretty far into the woods to get away from that. And it, it's <laughs> full circle. Yeah, that's wild. I It's funny because here in, you know, there's a lot of hemp being grown in Kentucky. And I remember I was talking to somebody that grows hemp um, for CBD oil. And they uh, we were talking about the byproducts and they were talking about how they have all this silage left over. And I got really excited and I was like, well, are you all using it? And they're like, no, we're just, you know, we're throwing it away. Um, and I was like, well, can I have it? And she, and she was like, no, you can't because you don't have the hemp license. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And I, I, yeah, I was kind of heartbroken. I was like, oh, that's such a waste of this massive pro. I mean, the massive plant. Exactly. Um, and it's, it's, Mistakes like that, that I, I really don't think could endure. I mean, I hope I'm, I'm not wrong, but I feel like this right out the gate, this was an interface with people who knew the, the, the plant intimately and what it needed and how to grow it, you know, 
secretly, honestly, how to grow it with nobody's input. And then it went straight from there to people who have never seen the plant, maybe never used it, have no idea how it's grown and have no interest in agriculture. And that they have not met, the paths are not crossing or joining. And it's, it's such a strange time that I don't think could remain long into the future. Yeah. Well, that, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's unfortunate to, to, to hear, you know, um, how restrictive it is, especially because it's just another really great plant. And exactly. Um, it could be another really great option for cover cropping. I've heard, um, and yeah, and just being able to utilize the plant to its full potential is really exciting. I will say of all the, you know, the, the problems we've had with the compliance process, the absolute silver lining and all of it has been the community that is emerging and the ability, you know, the first year we were a compliant farm, we had a farm tour and we hadn't been able to have a farm tour ever. You know, we had very few friends that could make it here and getting to, <laughs> I hear my baby crying. I got to make it, but the technology share and the knowledge share has been incredible. Uh, you know, one of the other silver linings is, especially when we talk about all this regulatory stuff is that, um, besides the nonsensical regulatory stuff, we have some of, uh, the most sensible testing and environmental regulations out there. Some of the regulations have gone on too far far and are not sensible, but we're seeing um, a level of responsibility to growing this crop for the compliant market that's unparalleled. And I really wish was applied to, to more things. So you can't, everything you put out um, in the state of California gets tested thoroughly and it can't be the metals. It's tested for every pesticide you can imagine and it can't have any residual pesticides in it. Um, you have to clear about the water you're using to grow it and making sure that you're not irresponsibly taking that out of a creek that fish would be using. There's all these things that are, are very well-intentioned and um, it, it's great to see. You really can't use chemical pesticides on cannabis and sell it in California. So um, there are there are silver linings that are coming out of the regulatory burden. Yeah, that's great. I mean, if you think about tobacco, like the number of chemicals that are used on on and around tobacco are pretty uh, uh, kind of unbelievable. I mean, we we're in fully in tobacco country, so you see them, um, you know, uh, spraying the things that that stop the flowering and all all of that, and it, uh, sucker dope, I think, is what they call it. And um, and then you imagine people ingesting that in one way or another, generally smoking it. And, and it, yeah, it's nice to hear that there is that element of it that um, that made it through the legislation. And there's so many of the, those chemicals, too, that not only are, are horrible for you to ingest, but change through combustion to be even worse. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Right. You don't want to light those on fire and then smell the smoke. That's 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 even worse. Um, yeah. In terms of potential for using cannabis on a vegetable farm for those who are maybe going to be or are uh, legally allowed to grow it, like, is there anything else there that you think is really important to mention? Um, well, I just think it's a really fascinating crop. It's, um, you know, it spends such a long time in the ground. So you have your, your management concerns similar to like, you know, tomatoes or, or peppers or things that... Um, because of the length of time they're in the ground, you really have to think of them spatially in relation to all your other crops and and their care as far as um, disease and pest stuff. Um, and, you know, it's just beautiful. Um, when you, you, you think about like texture and form in the garden, it, it's one of the more beautiful plants that's out there. And I think it's a, it's a real opportunity um, for folks, for, for small farmers, especially, I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of small farmers out there have been growing cannabis to support their small farms through the years. Um, and the opportunity to do it legally and introduce a new plant that you haven't played with before into your garden and see how it, um, interacts with the other plants and, and potentially, um, depending on uh, how the industry is in your state or the possibility as we go into a national industry, um, 
uh, a potential cash crop that that can help to have especially the really small farms um, make it yeah that's great well I guess I don't know if Taylor's still on mute, but I want to thank. I I, ju I just came back for the last bit. <laughs> well, oh, and by the way, Asher's awake, so I'll go on mute and go say hi to him. Sounds okay, good. Okay, well, I'm gonna t I'm gonna cut it off and say, Daniel and Taylor, thank you so much for uh, for coming on the podcast and talking with me. Yes, thank you so much, Jesse. It's such a pleasure, and really, we all appreciate what you're doing so much. Yeah. Yeah so much we were really honored to be a, a part of it and i have learned so much in the last two seasons of listening to your podcast and and following the farms that have been on and exploring the ways that they've um they've created to to face some of the challenges that we all face as farmers All right, if you enjoyed that show, stop what you're doing and go check out Bryceland on Instagram and all the places. But Instagram in particular, there's that video of their light deprivation tunnel. And super cool. You should go check that out. Also, make sure to subscribe to this podcast wherever you're getting it. Please leave a review, but all reviews this week must include a description of how this podcast has actually helped you make better pasta. Huge thanks to Jackson Roulette and Josh Satin for their help with no-till growers. Also, enormous shout out to my wife, Hannah, for absolutely everything. Uh, thank you all for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye. I, I really appreciate your all's time, and, and I, I can hear kiddos. <laughs> yep, okay, this guy just woke up from his nap. Perfect timing, Asher. Perfect Good timing. job, yeah. Asher. <laughs> <laughs>